Good evening and welcome to this edition of Wyoming Signatures. I'm Mary Young. Tonight we focus on pills, potions and profits. The pharmaceutical industry has made a killing these last two decades on dietary supplements and both over-the-counter and prescription medications. Marketing drugs directly to patients is now a fact of life. Whereas just 20 years ago, television ads for Viagra, Claritin, and Prozac were considered scandalous. How did we go from a society in which mental illness carried tremendous stigma to one in which at least 10% of the population takes daily psychiatric drugs in the form of antidepressants? Charles Barber is the author of Comfortably Numb, How Psychiatry is Medicating a Nation. He joined me earlier to explain the factors at play. I worked in, in homeless shelters in Manhattan for 10 years, in, um, basically from 1990 to 2000. And in the beginning of that period, um, people had no I, I was a, a counselor and, and involved in getting people housing. And people, sort of well-educated people, would, in the beginning, in 1990, would wonder why I was doing that work and what were the drugs that these guys were on. and. Um, you know, what, what is this all about? And we're sort of critical of what I was doing or sort of, you know, why was I doing this work exactly? And then by 2000, these same sort of, you know, well-bred, educated people thought what I was doing was absolutely wonderful. And new diagnoses like bipolar disorder, which, you know, was sort of unknown in our culture or was incorrectly named manic depression and things like that. Uh, you know, had a working understanding of diagnoses and were on, you know, half of the medications that my severely mentally ill clients were on. And, you know, were asking me for advice about, you know, their daughter that had depression or bipolar disorder. And it was an absolute sea change, you know, in 10 years. And so that's actually your question is exactly the question that I asked. Like, how did this happen so quickly? Uh, what was the culture of it? The certainly new drugs came out heavily in the mid-90s in particular. But it seemed to me that what was changed even more profoundly was the culture surrounding mental illness. And in many ways for the better, you know, in some ways it was in the, in the room, it was a, something you could talk about, which you really couldn't before. Um, uh, but in other ways, you know, the, the, the loss of stigma only went so far. It sort of went to milder depression or milder anxiety. It didn't really transcend uh, to the severe mental illnesses of the people that I was working with. So now we have how much of the American population, um, 10, 11, I assume it's greater taking it's sort drugs? Of, you know, there's, there's different stats, but basically it's uh, on a consistent basis, 5% of American women, uh, I'm sorry, 5% of American men and 10% of American women are an, on antidepressants. Uh, antidepressants are the second most prescribed category of drugs in the United States and we were just looking at the numbers, it's 250 million prescriptions written in 2010 to Americans. So when you think about that, there's 300 odd million people in the country. Um, many people are getting multiple prescriptions, but at one point or another, there have been studies that have shown, you know, a third more uh, of Americans have tried the drugs or taken the drugs for some period of time. They're also, along with antipsychotic drugs, among the most profitable of uh, pharmaceutical drugs in the country. So it's huge business and a huge part of our everyday life. The supposition is that people really don't need a lot of these, that there are alternatives, which is what the second part of, of your book was about. Right. So was it a conspiracy with the pharmaceutical industry to make profits? Was it um, uh, um, Americans just plain being bored with their lives, or what were all the factors? Well, a lot, like a lot of these things, it wasn't a conspiracy. It's too complicated and too big to be a, you know, a one man in, you know, an office in Manhattan or something like that. Um, a, a bunch of social factors that I talk about in the book is like a perfect storm uh, that kind of came together to create this, you know, absolutely huge phenomenon. And at the source of it is a kind of confusion between big D depression and small d depression, uh, which big D depression meaning um, that you are truly disabled by, by the illness, that you have a hard time sleeping or you sleep all the time, you're having thoughts of suicide, you can't really function, you have no pleasure in your life. Those are among the, um, the, the formal diagnoses, uh, uh, symptoms of depression. 
what's happened in our culture is small d depression, which is basically can be anything from, you know, it's March and it's snowing to I'm having marital problems to I'm laid off to, you know, I'm just sort of bummed out. That's been labeled as depression as a potentially clinical syndrome when, uh, you know, in a lot of ways that's life. I mean, life is difficult. That's sort of an un-American sort of concept that, you know, that, that we don't like to acknowledge. And so what it's been subsumed into is sort of a clinical biochemical language and people have been very quick to go to the antidepressants when they're, whether they're truly depressed is very marginal at best in a clinical sense. So in that regard, my kind of work with people with severe mental illness, where I've worked with people with suicidal depressions and psychotic depressions, um, where the drugs can be very appropriate or absolutely appropriate, there's, it's like night and day between that and being a functioning kind of bummed out person, you know, dealing with the bad economy, with, um, you know, the mundane aspects of life. But in terms of, so, so that fundamental confusion is sort of at the heart of it. In terms of sort of technical uh, forces that, that made this, this phenomenon happen, the number one thing is the, the TV advertising of drugs, which has not been around really for that long, really just the late 90s. And it was a technical rule change uh, with the FDA and the FCC that allowed that to happen. And so what happened is there were psychiatric drugs, but they weren't household names. And starting in the late 90s, they, you couldn't, and, and it's even true today, you can't watch TV, you know, primetime TV for more than like 10 minutes before you see an advertisement for a mood stabilizer or an antipsychotic or a sleep medication, a psychiatric drug. Those are all psychiatric drugs. And so they became like the celebrities of drugs, like Prozac and Zoloft and Paxil. So that if you were to say one thing, that was it. Other reasons, um, the, the, uh, there was an expansion of psychiatric diagnoses. And again, it kind of moved to a more watered down version. It still includes, obviously, p things like schizophrenia and major psychotic disorders. But the, the new manuals for psychiatric diagnosis include things like adjustment disorder, which is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you're going through a divorce, you're going through a, a, a life change. And um, so we've sort of thought of psychiatric illness no, not so much as illness, but life disorders adjusting to life. And so again, it points the way to looking at uh, the things that we're going through as illnesses rather than normal life. Now, we still don't know exactly how these antidepressants or the serotonin regulators work. We, we don't, so why right. would people take them? Uh, well, you know, first of all, they can be effective. I mean, and they can be effective for people with even the small d depression. So, you know, one of the major points I try and make in my, in my book and in my talks is, is mental illness is enormously complicated. And that's part of the reason why we're actually drawn to these sort of simple fixes and simple ways of looking at things. I mean, I've worked in the field for many years and I have a hard time figuring out a lot of the issues. It's, we're, we're drawn to these simplistic solutions because it's such, you know, between nature and nurture and how it plays out in our culture, it's an enormously complicated. Um, what we've clung to is these overly simplistic um, biochemical explanations. There's some truth, there's some relationship between serotonin and depression. Uh, but what that is, and, and to say it's just a deficit of serotonin, is like the cartoon version of the science. And for, for the book, I talked to you know, Nobel Prize winning scientists and leading neuroscientists, and the really smart ones, the ones that really the top of their profession, have the confidence and the, the security to say, we don't understand how this stuff works. We have no idea. And the, the sort of, you know, they're, they're making progress, you know, so it's, it's not like, you know, there's not good things going on in the scientific world, but we're sort of, I, in my opinion, we're probably 50 years away from a, from a rational psychopharmacology where you could really say, this is the kind of depression that we think you have, these are some of the deficits, this is like a flow chart of a treatment that it, we know would be helpful. Uh, right now it's a lot of sort of hit and miss, and you know and I know, and probably everybody listening to this show knows 
um, that people are, get put on one drug and then another drug and this and that, and it's just sort of a shotgun approach at this point. Um, when, when you talk to the top brain scientists, basically what they say, they don't say it as simply as this, but basically what happens in the brain, when you do anything to the brain, uh, you know, a chemical change, it, it induces a cascade of, of changes. And it's almost like an infinite cascade over time. And so to get a handle in a simplistic way, a one-to-one -one match for something like that, is enormously complicated. So we've sort of jumped the gun in our sort of American techno, we've figured it all out kind of way. Uh, not that we're not making progress, not that some of the brain imaging isn't very powerful, but it's still absolutely crude science, and we've sort of exaggerated our ability to understand how these drugs really work. In the part of the book where you talk about alternatives to dependence on drugs, you mention factors such as connections to the community, um, looking forward to doing something tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You use Rex as a great example of this, even though he's you know, he's, how can I put this, he would fall under severe mental illness and most mm -hmm. of us, he is really a good role model for what any, any, mm -hmm. any person would need. Mm -hmm. Something to look forward to ties to the community. Well, in today's world where the internet, the, the gaming, you know, teenage boys, they don't socialize in person anymore. They mm -hmm. all get online and you might have like six boys across the country, uh, you know, talking through the internet. And so I guess what I'm saying is it's, is the community changing? Are we going to have the ties? Or are we in for some real rocky um, emotional and, and, and mental difficulties in the future with all this technology? My guess is the latter to what you just said. I think the, the real answer is we don't quite know. It seems to me that the internet is this wonderful monster that we haven't yet figured out how to manage and, and use in our lives productively. So every other week, you, le you know, you learn about some politician who's gotten into trouble for doing something. It's like as a culture, we don't yet know what to do with this, you know, powerful, the likes of which we haven't seen in our, you know, probably your and my lifetime. I, there's a huge body of work to do about the impact of the impact, impact of the internet on our emotions. I mean, I, I spend my days on the computer, uh, you know, a lot of times, and I feel sort of depressed and bummed out after three hours, even though there's supposedly connections like emailing you in Wyoming and so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's a great unknown. Um, when you talk to people who have recovered from mental illness and, and severe mental illness, and that's what I've done a lot of my work with, and you ask them what helped them get better, um, invariably they say a social reason. It's connected to a person, it's often a spiritual reason, it's often, you know, I, I ran programs for people with severe mental illness, they'd say things like, my granddaughter was born and I didn't want to see her, I didn't want her to see me like this. Um, it's always kind of connected to the social context in the ways in which they get better. It's often, but not as much as you would think, a doctor or a counselor. Uh, it's usually more finding meaning in their life in the context of the illness. So it's less you conquer the illness or you eradicate the illness the way that the drug ads would make you f think that that's the way it works. It's more that you find meaning in living with an illness. And very often, as you, you know, point out, that happens in a social context. And so not that there shouldn't be formal psychiatric treatment for severe mental illness, but the kind of the, the icing on the cake, the way that people get through the hard times is finding meaning in their life and finding ways to get through it. And it, again, it's in, 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 in work with other people in relation to other people, or often just things that they're really interested in that, that kind of, to me, one of the defining aspects of mental illness or mental health, I should say, is having something to look forward to. Because then you can say, I can get through, you know, the, the incapacitating depression because I know something will happen that I'm looking forward to. Again, one of the hallmarks of severe depression is you don't have pleasure. So it, it all t transpires in a, in a family environment, in a cultural environment, and you're absolutely right that we're in the midst of this sort of paradigm shift where all those social things are getting, you know, removed by the way that they're, we're living. And it just in, in real simple terms, 
isolation, which is, you know, absolutely um, part and parcel with mental illness, um, is increasing. So the, the predictive factors for getting better in, in any mental illness, a large part of it is social support. And what's kind of happening, and as you're pointing out with sort of concern of what's going on in our culture, is those supports, you, you could either say they're being eradicated because we're all on the computer all day or, you know, doing things like this and, you know, uh, and or you, you could argue and some people would argue it's a different type of support, you know, that it's still just you're still making connections. I'm old fashioned enough to think that it's not quite the same uh, as one to one contact as you know, personal contact as contact with a therapist, for example. Uh, so I'm very suspicious of all this sort of web-based mental health, which is an, another sort of exploding area. What about the economy? World economic collapse, is that making people take more antidepressants? Um, when I met with my editor in New York uh, in, the, in the early stages of Comfortably Numb, this would have been the early 2000s, I said that um, I thought that the use of antidepressants would go down starting at about 2004. And should I write the book as sort of a period of American life where this antidepressant phenomenon just took off, but was a kind of discrete period that went down around the mid 2000s? It, basically, it started in 1988, uh, which is when Prozac was introduced through 2005. And he, he's a New York editor that, you know, deals with a lot of neurotic uh, writers. And, and he said, absolutely not. You know, these, this thing is going to get bigger and bigger, the, which he was absolutely right. And it's getting bigger and bigger. The reason why I thought, it, and I was wrong, that it would be a constricted phenomenon is that the advertising, which I mentioned is sort of the, if you were to pick num the number one thing, that for antidepressants has slowed down a lot in the last few years for a simple technical reason, meaning that Prozac, Paxil, and Zoloft, which were the big sellers, went off patent. So they were no longer, uh, they went to generic form and not owned principally by the drug company that invented them. And their profits went down, and so they weren't advertising. They're not staples of, you know, primetime advertising. What's happened is other psychiatric drugs have sort of taken their place. But the prescription rates just go up every year and, and is now the 250 million. And I would say uh, that that is the internet, that is Iraq and Afghanistan, and the rates of the use of these drugs for people coming back and their families and so on is, you know, through the roof, as you might imagine. Uh, I think it's the economy. And I think it's just become a staple of American life. It's just the thing you do that your primary care doctor, which is the people that prescribe most of these drugs, another paradigm shift, it used to be just psychiatrists primarily, um, that's what you do. You know, that if you're feeling, if you go to your doctor and you've seen these ads on TV and they say, ask your doctor about, this is sort of the reflex, this is the default. And there has been less sort of questioning about what this is. Other cultures, it's the exact opposite. So for example, in Britain, um, there's clinical guidelines published by the National Health Service. They only go to antidepressants if you've, you've gone through other stages and they haven't worked. So watchful waiting is the first step. If someone comes in with this complaining of sort of mild to moderate depression, you just see if it kind of lifts through life changes. Maybe they get a job or their marital situation gets better you know, then things like counseling, then things like exercise, then things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a, a sort of technical form of therapy to address symptoms of anxiety and depression. Then, if those things don't work, then you go to antidepressants. And it's literally one, two, three, four, five. That's the British model. Our model is number one, go to antidepressants. Number two, we probably don't even get to those other things. I mean, because again, it's it's this sort of American phenomenon of the high tw high tech, the quick fix, the fast food nation on antidepressants, and not the sort of more subtle, more patient looking at the social context, what's going on with your life, and so on and so forth. So it it is a profoundly American phenomenon um, that just seems to have occupied a place in our, our cultural life now that isn't going away. 
my, to the degree that I thought it would, but it, it's, it hasn't. Well, we're grateful that you could come and share your oh. expertise with us. Thank you so much.